Hello, I'm Charlie Rossiter, and welcome to Poetry Spoken Here on YouTube. We're the longest-running all-poetry interview podcast in existence. Be sure to subscribe to the channel so you never miss an upload. But you don't have to wait for YouTube uploads. You can also download the show from Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever you get your podcasts. Enjoy the show. I'm Charlie Rossiter, and this is Poetry Spoken Here. On today's podcast, we feature the work of poet Jude Genero of Ellison Bay and Long Lake, Wisconsin. Jude's poems focus on family, the natural world, and life with Door County writer and publisher Norb Bly, her partner, until his passing in 2013. We recorded her interview in Door County, Wisconsin, at Right On Door County, where we had joined with others to celebrate Norb and the relocation of his chicken coop writing shack from the site of his former home to the grounds of this wonderful writing center. In the second part of the show, I'm joined by Twin Cities professor Jerry Chavis, an expert in romantic poetry, to examine the poem, She Walks in Beauty. We're here today talking with Jude Genero up here in Door County, way up in northern Wisconsin. She lives up here and has been writing for quite a number of years. She's the author of The Chapbook's Base Camp, More Than One Door, and The Lingerie Chest. So, Jude, I'm glad we could manage to do this, that I could get up here to talk to you. It's good to have you back in dark. It's been <laughs> too thanks. long. That's right. It has been a while. Since this is called Poetry Spoken Here, mm -hmm. what are your views in terms of the idea of you know, reading poems on the page versus speaking them or hearing them spoken? You know, I think it makes a big difference when you hear the poet read them. Uh, a number of times I've read a book of poetry and it just didn't click for me. But then I had an, an opportunity to hear the poet that wrote them mm -hmm. he, read them. And the inflections and the emotional tone is so much more meaningful when you hear them that all of a sudden the poem... In fact, I heard a person read one of mine once that I thought was a fairly mediocre poem. The way the person read it, I thought, hey, that's not bad. <laughs> So I think it makes a difference to hear them if a person, uh, and I'm not a good reader of poems myself, reading them out loud. Mm. I, I, ha I talk too fast and I get breathy, but um, I think it's good to hear the poetry read, read. Let's just get right into some of your poetry. You said you've got various things about children, grandchildren, family, yeah, my life, fa whatever. My focus on in poetry generally tends to be the natural world, the family, and um, the man. <laughs> Sounds reasonable for a woman. There you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, haiku was one of the things that we focused on in our early writing years, and uh, I had a few for the seasons I thought I'd start with. For January, eerie silver steel moon turns bronze at sunrise. Promises, promises. Summer. Afternoon on the dock, trying to slow summer down. So much faster than I. Fall. There's a fog come lifting out of the swamp, though not my heart. December. Christmas must be over. There's a baseball in the manger. <laughs> Which uh, kind of leads me into children. Well, yeah, that's true. Now, what, do you still write haiku? You know, it's a good... You, you think of one. They just fly in, and if you're mm. smart enough, you, you run right home and write it down. Yeah. Capture it when it's flying, but it's not uh, a focus. You know, I think everything comes that way. You know, you, you grab yeah. it when you see it go flying yeah. by in your head. So. Yeah, I just, every once in a while I notice, oh, I haven't written any haiku. Maybe I should like, lean, try to lean my brain that way if good, I can. Good practice. But, yeah, mm -hmm. just like that. Yeah. Children. The Zen of Children. Four-year-old George flung the wild frisbee forward. It flew sideways, lopping off the top of a lush red about-to-burst bloom lily. Not his fault. Frisbee retrieved, I dialogued the finer points of Frisbee launching, and we continued flinging, but I continued looking sideways at my decapitated lily. After several minutes of focused flinging and my wayward glances, George looked me directly in the eye with wise instructions of his own, don't look at it. <laughs> Solved everything. How many uh, grandchildren do you have? We have uh, three boys one granddaughter she's in college mm -hmm. so and boys have filled my life 
which um, kind of led to this poem called Children. Children are not easy, especially, sorry, boy children. Bursts of random screeching fills the air as they dismantle globes, lamps, and your salad shooter, or set up bevies of basketball hooplets assembled from your picnic table nets to hang precariously from the upstairs loft. Mysterious marbles roll from somewhere deep within the dark interior of your Hewlett Packer printer. A garage remote went missing years ago, now joined by several flashlights and an earring that they were certain belonged in a tackle box. Only thing easy about children is the love. My favorite topic became, I, I was said to you earlier, I started writing, po I'd always written technical writing, essays, uh, journaling, but I wanted to take, uh, I wanted to shift into a creative writing zone, and I took a class back in 1994 uh, pretty rapidly fell in love with the teacher, and uh, that became my muse and my focus for writing for many years, and uh, a lot of my writing is about that person. So, And we'll get to that later in the show. And the other focus has been the natural world. I mentioned that, and I have a place up in the North Woods that uh, this was generated um, in. It's called Vespers. Dinner is but a memory, friends long gone home, but Nora Jones still sings her spell on this open window night of forest air and screen port solitude, alone, like the whole North Woods is just this, and no one's out there, nowhere, but me. Yeah, poems of being out in nature are always appealing. Do you read any particular poetry for like as a jump starter to get inspired and you would pretty much not do that I'm just curious I read a lot of poetry my favorite poets range from Mary Oliver who I think is everybody's favorite poet mm -hmm. uh, to Charles Bukowski who is not everyone's favorite but boy does he punch <laughs> it and, and I, the contrast is so great and then every once in a while you find a, um, a poem of his that is very natural um, or very not very uh, emotional and not quite as uh, punchy as as he you know, normally is. Yeah. So it's a wide range. I love Mae Sarton, uh, oh, yeah. Elizabeth Sargent, uh, Al Di Genova. Most of my friends in uh, my write our writing classes were uh, became my favorite poets. Yeah. Well, Bukowski, I find, because he tells stories, um, he, I find him a bit inspirational that any little thing can be done as a story in a, and put into a poem. Mm -hmm. And... I sometimes have to be remind have to be reminded of that because I don't want to be a fiction writer. Mm -hmm. But I say, wait a minute, he, that's just a little story, but somehow he made it a poem. Somehow he does that. Yeah. Yeah, and I so I definitely agree that he can be inspirational or of kind of a jump starter kind of guy. Right. Now, if you want to hear more of the natural world, I have mm -hmm. to grab the other book. I'll read two more in the natural, and then time's flying. A couple more. A couple more. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Let's back to nature. I think my father generated my uh, interest in the natural world when I was a young child, and he was a person that worked as a machine and die tool mechanic, and we lived in suburbs of Detroit, and he had very little time that he could get out in the wild world. But um, this this poem was generated from my dad. It's called Churchery. <laughs> the red-winged blackbird, song, brings trout to mind, and my dad, standing midstream in the pier market, Flicking a line, casting to the shallows, focused on shadows in the water. A red-winged blackbird holds tight to a cattail, bobbing in the sun, trilling. Pop only marked time between seasons, waiting for the lilacs to bloom. Song of the red wing meant he was there, summer, on a trout stream. That bird's still calling for him, but he's free now, forever chasing trout, youth, and the dream to hold on to both. Churchery. <laughs> it's nice to have a red-winged blackbird as a reminder because they're fairly common. So you get a lot of reminders. Yes, a lot of reminders. And the campfire became a, uh, an iconic event in our family. I wrote one for that. It's called Campfire. Carry logs to the pit. Birch for quick start. Pine descent. Oak brings the heat. Stack a teepee high, stuff in news of the day, and light with four wooden matches. Stand and watch, fanning leaves, twigs, and feed the curling flame. Stand back. Fold your arms and study. Flames tango in the breeze. 
Fan the timid licks to full crackle. Pop, dodge the sparks and spray. Duck in, lay more wood, cross center. Smoke swirls its primitive incense, filling clothes, hair, lungs, and your soul. Inhale. Stand, turn around, warm front to back. Embers glow, snap. Move the timbers, poke and shake. Sit, watch, do you see it? Call the memory ghosts to the circle. Tell the stories of the clan through the black sky night. It's good to have that in a poem. There, I find that there are people today because of uh, the stuff you squirt on the grill, which are who don't know how to light fires because they pull that stuff out right away instead of doing a little teepee oh, or whatever with the kindling. It's part of the fun. Huh? Yeah. Well, yeah, a feeling of accomplishment. I uh, spent years teaching my sons to do, build a proper log cabin fire. They ignore me. <laughs> <laughs> It almost sounds like a haiku, except the f- at they ignore me. Sounds like the last of a haiku, they ignore but me. <laughs> the first part's got a few too many syllables. There you go. The lake I live on up north uh, has uh, thirty-two nesting loons on it, so we are gifted with the sound of loons Ooh, that's morning right. and night. Yeah, that's great. And this was generated by one of them who who uh, speaks to me almost nightly called Alone. All day yesterday a loon called in distress. At dusk the call continued. I felt sadder and sadder. Whatever was going on still was not resolved. Was she on her nest? Did he not come home? A call so lonely it cuts the air in silver threads even when all is well. I went to bed with windows open. She was still calling. So far this morning all is quiet. They are mournful. They are. I have a friend who can imitate them pretty well, and I just I love it. It's just... I have amused my family through the years by learning to do the whale. I promise you I won't do it here, but oh. the yodel is my specialty. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you sure you don't want to no. you go? No. Uh, okay. <laughs> no. Sorry, folks. There are limits. There are limits. We do not want to push our poets to be silly. I'm talking... Uh. To, I'm, I'm going to shift over and read the ones that uh, are probably most deeply meaningful for me, but... Um, Okay. My partner, who passed away two years ago, and uh, I put a collection together of out of the probably hundreds of poems I'd written about uh, Norbert Bly, and I put a collection together just for so they'd be in one place. You know, you don't want things to get lost, and I thought that would um, fill a need I had at the time to yeah. kind of bring things together. And, the collection begins with the early poems I wrote about him, and mm-hmm. it kind of ends in the sadder parts of um, after he passed on. But I will maybe stick to the funner parts, funner okay. the po- funner poems. And before you start, I'll mention that we're here in Door County in Fish Creek because of a dedication ceremony that will happen in the morning. Uh, Norb had had a chicken coop that he had converted to his writer's shack and it functioned year round as I understand it it was just an incredible place filled, just filled (laughs) with literary things and he worked there and it's been moved to this property in Fish Creek uh, and tomorrow is a a dedication celebratory memorial ceremony that will happen and that's why we happen to be here in the same place and can do the interview and uh, as you read these you won't hear me talking or questioning in between I think it's better to just experience this little suite of poems. Well, thank you. A soulmate is. Home from work, I crash, exhausted. The house empty, dark, but for the blinking flash of the message machine. Press the button, I hear his excited voice reading passages from a new book of poetry we'd been searching for. 700 kisses. Just found and he couldn't wait, so called and began reading and reading. I sat down to listen as he read on and on, laid down on the floor as his voice kept reading. The tape beeped its over signal, cutting him off. Beep! Again, next message. The voice continued on reading and reading words that crackled red, gold, and purple, casting the empty room in disco light. This next one is called Listening. There are times... You think I'm listening to you, my eyes riveted, intent, but my thoughts are of lips brushing across your brow to the soft dent of your temple. Across the top of your ear, down along your hairline, stop to lick lightly the small triangle near your collarbone. Taste the sweet hollow at the base of your neck. 
Skiff then to the center of your chest and there lay my face against the warmth of your body. I am listening. Caught. Sometimes you catch me on long rides in the car or reading the paper after dinner, staring at your face when you think that you don't when I think that you don't see me, and I'm embarrassed for how to explain what it is I'm looking for. Nothing. Only that I so love your face near me, and dear as it is, I let my gaze linger, celebrating features that so engage my senses, lined by a history I did not share. Eyelash etchings frame eyes that love me and see a future that is ours. No, I'm going to read an up, upbeat one called The Rush. The Rush. I want you always driving up to my door in the rain, honking the horn so I can run out the door, flashing as much leg as I can kick out from under a raincoat, jump in your car and run up the road to some dark bar where I can flip off my shoes and creep my toes up under the table and rest them in your lap and all the other places I'd rather be but will settle for later when I get you home. Good God, baby, get us home. <laughs> yeah, I remember that one from I the book. It's really, it. that's a very cool poem. Thank you. Not everybody might get it. But. <laughs> Honeymoon. Drink espresso late at night. Read in bed till 2 a.m. Light the candles, do not sleep, and make love like you never did before. There was that time. That time we hid in the forest, a tangle of legs and arms and whispered plans and futures. There was that time we heard the cry of gulls and our own, searching for a way. There was that time we danced in the kitchen, mixing garlic and butter and wine with pasta and shrimp and passion. There was that time we claimed as ours, knowing time was not our friend. Ah, short haiku. In this room, walls stand witness to love's passion, survive fire and ice. Haunting. I wrote this one just um, shortly before he passed on, not knowing or believing that he was going to, but it seemed to almost um, forecast. Haunting. It could have been the wind battened around the house, the brass chimes maniacally clanging against the timbers, waking me in the hours, those wee small hours I used to sleep. It could have been the silent moon's furtive sliding toward my window, branding its lament on your empty pillow, knowing what haunts the little hours is you. This one is called, What Do We Miss? When life gets quiet, what do we miss? Afternoons curled in the crook of your arm, hotel rooms by a great lake, sipping espresso between movies and walks, black stocking nights in East Town, and your face. And I miss you at breakfast, rattling papers and dishes, rides round the island, the dog in the back, arm in arm, in arm walking fields in the fall, good night kisses, turn down the lights, step up the stairs, and I miss trust in tomorrow. Beautiful. Thanks so much for including those in your reading. Thank you. I'm really, really glad you did, and I think it's good for people to hear those, hear what can be expressed, you know, with poetry. They're not easy ones. No. You want one more short one? Sure. No, it's the one more long one. It's sort of a oh, summary so, of oh, last okay. year. These days, one. A lot of my people live alone in solitude these days. My perfect world would be life in the compound with all of them close by. Privacy intact, but close enough to be there in the hour seeking company and solace. The bookman would start a fire and set sentry in the orchard. Open a bottle of wine, and before long there would come the carpenter through the lilacs with his glass and a basket of food. I'd wander over with the dog. Others would come up the wooded lane, our families and dear ones close in the beloved village, welcome, well, most of them, and find their way to the circle of fire, and we'd talk. Two, the lost one is always with me. I have no wish to ever again explain who I am and what I want and what's important to me to anyone, but mostly... I want no one else. Three, I call the dog to my side and walk the roads with him in silence. Thank you. Thank you, Charlie. It was uh, an honor to be here with you. We've been talking with G. Genero here on Poetry Spoken Here. We're going to spotlight a poem that was written in the early 1800s, a 
a poem that is still very much with us today. It was written by Lord Byron, one of the great Romantic era poets. We'll begin with a reading by Paul Geiger, a talented voiceover specialist who recently returned from an operatic engagement at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. After his reading, we'll be joined for discussion by an expert in the field of Romantic poetry. Now, here's Paul Geiger reading She Walks in Beauty. She Walks in Beauty by George Gordon, Lord Byron. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies, and all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes, thus mellowed to that tender light which heaven to gaudy day denies. One shade the more, one ray the less, had half impaired the nameless grace which waves in every raven tress, or softly lightens o'er her face, where thoughts serenely sweet express how pure, how dear their dwelling place. And on that cheek and o'er that brow, so soft, so calm, yet eloquent, the smiles that win, the tints that glow, but tell of days in goodness spent, a mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent. And now I'm joined by Jerry Chavis, a professor at uh, St. Catherine's College up in the Minneapolis area, and she's been teaching literature for many years and knows a lot about poetry of this type and this particular poem. So, Jerry, welcome to Poetry Spoken Here. Thank you. Okay, let me just start by saying, when I asked you to do this, you said you'd be happy to join in and be part of the show. And uh, I asked, gave you some choice of what poem we would talk about. And mm -hmm. you said you'd like to talk about this one. So I'm wondering why you wanted to pick this one. Uh, because it idolizes uh, women. And I find that to be a really interesting topic. The image of the perfect female. Uh, I've been studying that not only in poetry, but also in painting. And also it's by Byron, who is a, a most intriguing writer who had quite a history with women. And so I find this very innocent kind of poem interesting in light of his life and who he was. The other reason is that it was set to music and I've actually played the music for my students. It was set to music by a Jewish composer who was a contemporary of Byron's. His name was Isaac Nathan. And it was published, uh, this poem was published in a, an anthology called Hebrew Melodies. And so it was um, sung in a sing-song kind of way that was almost cantorial and very mesmerizing. When I played it for my students, all of us, they and I had it in our heads the whole day because it's a very melodic poem, as you, you can hear. And you can actually see how, how uh, rhythmical and symmetrical it is. So it lends itself to a, a very mellow kind of music. So that's at least three reasons why I chose wow. this poem. Pretty good. So I, I hadn't thought of it coming at it from a a feminist perspective of it being a thing about a woman. Uh, she's, mm -hmm. he strikes me as the kind, at least my image is someone who might be the type who might end up on a fainting couch. She seems <laughs> to me, to me kind of uh, ethereal. You know, I see the contrast maybe because of light and dark. So I think she's a very pale skinned, you know, Victorian style with the raven tresses though. And, and mm -hmm. I, I see her standing in moonlight. Yeah, the uh, image of her as dark, as a, as a lady of evening, uh, I think that's, that's a really important part of this. And, and one of the things that I think uh, made Byron choose night imagery and evening imagery is that she was wearing a black gown that probably had spangles on it. She was a distant relative of his, uh, so some cousin of some sort, and was... Um, someone he saw at a party, she was wearing actually a mourning dress. So that's why she was wearing black. 
uh, that would have been, uh, you know, unusual for every day to be wearing black. But if you were in mourning, that was something that you wore as as respectful. Her name was Lady Wilmot Horton, and uh, she was. Um, I don't know if she's about his age because he was a, he was 26 years old already when he met her. He saw her in 1814, and he proceeded to liken her to a starry night because of the spangles and the dark background. And I think he is idealizing her because he's talking about gaudy day. He's contrasting her to all those gaudy beauties that have a different kind of, you know, in your face beauty. And the raven tresses, of course, fit that. Your image of her is pale. I think that that makes sense because her skin would have been fair and very, very much in contrast to the black gown that she was wearing and the black hair. You know, it's interesting, there, there's two texts in the Romantic period. There's the, uh, the golden haired, and then there's the dark lady. The dark lady is usually more the vampish type of female. But in this case, she is that innocent, pure, beautiful woman. And I think he, he kind of worshipped her from afar. I don't even know if they had a conversation. There isn't anything else on record as to um, what, if he had any relationship with her at all. So it probably was, I can worship you from afar. And it, you know, another reason why I was interested in this poem is because it was written during the Romantic period. And the Romantic period is a, a specialty of mine. And it was a time when writers like to exaggerate. They, they like to look at the perfection in the world and the highs and the lows and, and speak in extreme terms. So this is very typical of a romantic idealization of the woman. So she's either a vampire type female or she's someone who's totally innocent. And notice that she's, she's perfect. She's perfect in every way. Uh, not only does she not have the, the gaudy day about her, but she also has a mind that is totally devoid of any evil whatsoever. Uh, with thoughts serenely sweet express how pure, how dear their dwelling place. In, in a very real way, the female in this poem is a forerunner of the angel, the angel in the house. She's the perfect woman. And that angel would become uh, much more prominent in the period following Byron's work. So she can do no wrong. What do you, what do you think? Uh, is there anything Jungian here with this dark and light? I suppose you could do a Jungian analysis, um, but I think there's there's really no suggestion that she does have a shadow side in the Jungian terms. Uh, oh, the, it's only her looks, uh, her image that has the dark and light, you're saying. Yeah, right, you're right. And it, it's kind of like he's trying to say, you're so perfect because one shade the more and one ray the less. That if yeah. you, it, it's so perfect, what, whatever kind of dark and light you have that you're showing tonight, it, mm -hmm. it couldn't be any different. If, we, if it were hair different, you wouldn't be perfect as you are. And, uh, you know, the, the fact that he's saying that her, her cheek, her brow, everything's soft and calm and eloquent, and it shows how, how good she is inside. Since she's beautiful and calm and sweet on the outside, she's got to be having days of goodness, they tell of days of goodness spent, a mind at peace with all below. I mean, this woman never gets angry, right? She's never seen the dark side. She's so better I would than say, I thought. Wow. She's shadowless. <laughs> I don't know if she's ready for a fainting couch, but she's sure ready for a pedestal. <laughs> she's on it. And you know, what's interesting to me is that Byron was a famous womanizer. You know, in his day, his fame was equal to the Beatles and Elvis Presley. Uh, nothing short of that. Uh, number one, he was an aristocrat, so that helped. You know, he went into all the, the circles where they got a lot of publicity. But he also was extremely good looking. And he, um, well, he was troubled and a little crazy, too. And he was, he collected women like they were going out of style. So this, uh, he does write a number of love poems, and he does idealize women in a lot of his poems. But in real life, I think there was a mixture of, um, of some scorn with, with the attraction to women. Uh, he discarded mistresses as he went along the way, and he, he angered a lot of women. So 
Uh, I'm sure he had a very checkered relationship with women. Why do you think this poem has such enduring appeal all these years later? Right. Well, it's it's um, it's very musical. It's mm -hmm. very melodic. She walks in beauty like the night. Uh, it's it's actually a stunning poem. It's uh, you know like the woman. It's kind of a perfect poem in many ways. Uh, its images are are gorgeous, and maybe a lot of women like being idealized. Um, I'm surprised I haven't seen this particular poem on a lot of greeting cards, like Valentine's Day cards. <laughs> Uh, because uh, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. We find that, and that's written by Keats. We find that on greeting cards more frequently. Yeah. But um, certainly it's, um, you know, it's a poem without any flaws. It really is. Well, thank you, Jerry. This has been wonderful. And to get all this additional in-depth information about the poem. We're talking with Jerry Chavis on Poetry Spoken Here. Thank you. listening to Poetry Spoken Here. I'm Charlie Rossiter, inviting you to join us again next time to let poetry speak to you. Music for today's program was written and performed by Jack Rossiter Mundley. And remember, Poetry Spoken Here is more than a podcast. You can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash poetry spoken here. Follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash poetry spoken here. For more about today's show and other Poetry Spoken Here podcasts, as well as our blog, just visit our website, poetryspokenhere.com. If you'd like to submit suggestions of poets or topics for future podcasts, you can send to our email address, poetryspokenhere at gmail.com. <laughs>